Um, we're in a sermon series called Donkey Missions, and I stole the, the title from Matt Keller, who wrote a book by that name, observing the life of King Saul and his journey to becoming king. And his journey to becoming king is found in 1 Samuel chapter 9. And you see that Saul went on a donkey mission. Uh, and we're going to describe that donkey mission in just a second, but it stands as a reference point uh, for seasons of life that don't seem to make much sense. They're out of sync with the rest of the life that we're living. They're out of sync with the purpose that we believe maybe God has called us to. They're out of sync with our desire for our own lives in a season. And last week what we did is we looked and we, we realized that many of us find ourselves in donkey seasons and frustrated in the midst of a donkey season because we don't even recognize that it is a donkey season. Now, the thing about the donkey season is that, that, uh, is that it's rarely about the actual mission. It's rarely about the season. It's all about our heart and our orientation towards God, the things of God and the things of this world, how we relate to it and how we respond to it as it comes at us and as we go towards, towards it. Uh, today, we're on week two of a four-week series, and we're going to be talking about the present past, donkey missions, the present past past. And we're going to be observing uh, how our donkey missions cause us to encounter our past. And it brings our past into the present and calls us, calls us to wrestle with the reality of God in the midst of both of those things. What's going on, what's gone on, what is going on, and what will happen in the future. I have a friend, uh, this week he was inducted into the Fairfax County uh, Public School Hall of Fame. So Fairfax County is one of the, one of the biggest uh, public school systems in the United States. Very powerful, uh, very influential. It's right outside of Washington, D.C. And he was inducted for some extraordinary work that he's doing in the city to serve uh, the at-risk population, to serve people who, are, uh, who struggle with resources, who are below the poverty line, who are on the poverty line, who are trying to come out of poverty. He's doing extraordinary things, and he's leading a, mi a ministry called Grace Loves. And so the Hope Loves thing, Grace Loves, we stole it from him. So, uh, so when he stood there to receive his prize in front of all of these academics and in front of all of these teachers and Fairfax County <laughs> officials, he stood up there and he, he admitted to the whole room what those who knew him already knew. And that's that when he was in high school, he was an alcoholic. He stumbled through the hallways, uh, drunk much of the time. And when he did go to class, he was normally cheating uh, he barely eked by. He barely made it out of high school. He barely survived uh, that season of his life, but God preserved his life. And as he struggled through life trying to find his way, partying and being angry at the world for different things that he had encountered and struggling with certain weaknesses that confronted him in his life, he had an encounter with God. And in his encounter with God, he considered the life that he, the life that he had lived the life that he was able to make for himself and the life that Jesus was offering him. And he decided the life that Jesus was offering him was too great to hold on to what he could do for himself. And so he decided to say yes to Jesus and no to himself. He decided to say no to his former story and yes to God's future glory by, by surrendering his life to Jesus and, and deciding to let Jesus drive the direction of his life from that point on. As a result of that decision, he learned that his life, the purpose of his life wasn't just to be served, but his purpose in life was to serve others. And that's how he's made his life, and he's transformed thousands of, thousands of lives as a result of that decision. Now, you might not ever know his name, and that's why I'm deliberately not sharing it, because the kingdom of God is advanced by people like him, by people who consider their past, Consider what they can do for themselves and consider what God is offering and say yes to the glory of God and may live on anonymously for the rest of time, but change the world in the process. We're going to see today uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 9 that Kish, Saul's father, is only mentioned, his name's only mentioned like twice. He's mentioned right here at the beginning of 1 Samuel. And that's it. In the first Five verses of Samuel, we see his name, and he's Saul's dad. And then there's 22 chapters on Saul and his life. And that's the reality for most of us. We're going to be like Kish. We're going to be like my unnamed friend who had the opportunity to set up a story for somebody else, to do something extraordinary and have an opportunity to do something in God that we could never imagine otherwise. 
Wayne, if you could come forward, we're going to jump into the word. We're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. And then, uh, Wayne, after you read the first four, I'll take the mic back. I want to explain something. And then you'll read verses 19 through 21. So if you could go, go ahead and stand to your feet with us out of reverence for Scripture, because participation is better than? I just had to get it right for myself. <laughs> There was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekorath, son of Aphia of the tribe of Benjamin. His son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. One day, Kish's donkeys strayed away, and he told Saul, Take a servant with you and go look for the donkeys. So Saul took one of the servants and traveled through the hill country of Ephraim, the land of Shalishah, the Shalim area, and the entire land of Benjamin. But they couldn't find the donkeys anywhere. Saul's servant at this time said, hey, Saul, there's, this, there's a seer, a prophet, who's going to be able to help you get through this, who's going to help make sense of this journey. Maybe he can tell us where the donkeys were. And there was a little bit of a wrestle, and we'll talk about the wrestle next week, about what happened between Saul's decision to return home or Saul's decision to go find the prophet and have an encounter with God. We'll talk about that next week. But between here and there, it's the process of Saul and the servant finding Samuel the seer, which brings us to verse 19 or 18. I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up to the place of worship ahead of me. We will eat there together, and in the morning, I'll tell you what you want to know and send you on your way. And don't worry about those donkeys that were lost three days ago, for they've been found. And I am here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all Israel's hopes. Saul replied, but I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribe in Israel, and my family is the least important of all the families of that tribe. Why are you talking like this to me? Heavenly Father, it's a privilege to hear your word, and we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We need desperately to hear the essence of this message that you want to speak to our hearts. So we pray that your spirit would minister to us individually as we hear David preach. And we pray that you would give Pastor David the the, uh, boldness and the courage and the wisdom to speak your word uh, accurately and, and directly to our hearts. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. So donkey missions are these missions that seem to be a detour from the life that we're trying to live, the goals that we have, what we think God wants for us, and certainly most of the time, almost all the time, different than what we want for ourselves. It's these seasons that make no sense. Here in these first few verses, we learn that Saul's donkey mission to go find his father's donkeys took them through several different lands. It took them through the land of Ephraim, which means actually bounty or plentiful. And it was thought to be a, a, a land of, of double blessing. And when you think about that land of double blessing and you're walking through this place that's called blessing and then you find nothing, that can be discouraging. Has anybody else felt like maybe there was a time where everybody else in their life was thriving and everybody says, oh, the economy's going great, it's picking up, everybody's getting these new jobs and getting bonuses and making more money, and you're like, that's not my story. Anybody been there? Everybody's getting married or having good relationships or having babies, and you're struggling in the absence of those things, though you long for them to happen. Maybe other people are getting job interviews and internships if you're a student and, and they're thriving in their, uh, in their academic pursuits and, and you're struggling just to make the class and, and not, not get out. I, if that's your story, I'm telling you, C's get degrees. <laughs> look, yeah, look, we'll pray together. We'll pray together. I've got a C's gets degrees anointing on my life. Look, I, look, hey, look, so the only, the only advice I got from my school when it was time to apply for college in high school was, you know, hey, college isn't for everybody. That was, that was their advice to me. And then, and then this, 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 I, I had like a, I had some medical issues. I had some attention issues. I had some academic issues. I had some behavior issues. I got into school with a 1.7. I'm like, <laughs> won't God do it? Won't he do it? 
Y'all are like, that's wrong. Some of y'all are like, you're a donkey season. No, I got in. I didn't be, I got my, <laughs> Megan was there when I turned in my application, actually. We were just friends at the time, but, but they had closed, it was the last day of, of, uh, like, like, of, what do you call it? The deadline. It was the last day when you could turn things in. One of those. I don't even know what a deadline is. Yeah, so, so they, they locked the door, and I'm standing here with my application, and I'm like, ah, oh, dang it. Well, so I got down, I knocked on the door, and this lady was standing there. She's like, no, 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 no. So I got down on my hands and knees, and I was like, please. And she unlocked the door, and my, my application went to the top of the pile. And so I don't recommend that as a way of doing it. I recommend that as a way of not doing it. But I'm just saying when God wants to do a thing, he'll open doors that were closed, and he'll move things along. So that has nothing, I hope that helps somebody, because that has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. We're talking about how it took him through this place of blessing and he didn't receive any blessing and it wasn't working out for him. And that can be frustrating, disappointing, and it can, begin you, it can begin to cause you to question God's goodness towards you, God's purpose for you, or it can cause you to question your own thoughts about you and your own worth. It'll cause you to begin to think about your story and about ways that you've, God has either met you or not met you in the past, and it'll cause you to confront the things that you've come through or haven't come through yet. The next place uh, that, that Saul went was through the land of Benjamin. Now, this was through the land of his people. And so if you've ever gone home to the neighborhood that you grew up in, you kind of rethink all the kind of things that you used to think, and you're forced to think, and you're, like, confronted with who you were and what things were like. My friend, as he was being inducted into the Hall of Fame for Fairfax County, County Schools, was, was confronting his past. And he's going, isn't it an amazing thing that God has done? And it's extraordinary when it has that impact on our life. But a lot of times what happens when we turn to the place of our youth, when we return to the place of our family, we fall back into the old patterns. We fall back into agreement with the old things that were said about us. We fall back into agreement with the things that were spoken over our lives that have no truth, that maybe somebody said, not even on purpose, that defined our lives and maybe sent us in a direction positively or negatively. And Saul is going through his family's space. And after he goes through his family space, he has this encounter with God, verses 19 through 21. And when he has this encounter with God's, uh, God's man, with the presence of God represented through Samuel, when he said, I want to use you for my purposes, all that was on the front of Saul's mind was all the reasons he can't be the guy. All the reasons God wouldn't use him. I'm just from the tribe of Benjamin. But my clan is small and insignificant. I myself am no one. After surveying his family's land, after surveying the land of his people, after surveying this place of blessing and having no blessing of his own, he gets to this moment with God and he's drawing up blanks. Why would you even speak to me this way? Because his past was speaking to him more loudly than God's present voice. And he wasn't able to believe the word of God for his life because his past and his present were screaming at him. My concern for us is that we can be so tied up in what we were. We could be so tied up in what we are not. We could be so tied up in what we haven't experienced or haven't yet seen that when God comes to us and offers us something extraordinary and different, we'll decline because we don't we don't recognize it for what it is, an invitation to something new. I've got a few observations I want to make about this text, and then I want to talk about uh, some ways that we relate to our past that I think we need to acknowledge. And then I want to invite us all to pray and ask God to give us a fresh vision for what he wants for us. The first thing is this. I already said this, but the one verse on his dad in 22 chapters cover Saul's life. I can't help but think about the significance of sowing into other people's lives because of the chapters that have yet to be written in their lives. I think in today's society, we're so concerned with getting our own, our own name known that we haven't yet helped change somebody else's life so that they could live the life that God has called them to. There's a lot out there right now in, in, in uh, psychological kind of care, like mental health and emotional health care that's saying that the way, actually one of the primary ways to actually heal in your own is to help other people. 
And it's amazing. It's like just written right there into God's word for us. It was there from the very beginning, and it still waits for us today to join God in his great mission of making all things new. And it turns out it works for our mental and emotional health as well. Uh, the terrain that they went through was tough, and there's nothing, there's nothing like tough terrain and tough, diff- like difficult times and having to slow down and things going slower than you want them to go to really cause you to think <laughs> about what's happening. That's why we hate rush hour traffic, right? Like if you're stuck and there's an accident, you're not concerned for the people in the accident by and large, right? We could not care. We could care less. Like, okay, great. Somebody's, somebody's accident has interrupted my day. Because the slowing down requires us to confront ourselves. I quote this a lot, but Blaise Pascal, mathematician, philosopher in the 1500s, he's like, hey, look, most of men's problems stem from his inability to sit in a room quietly with himself. That was in the 1500s, y'all. Like, what what else did you have to do? Like, what was there? But now we find ourselves so distracted by Instagram and YouTube, and, and they make themselves even more distracting than they've ever been. Right, I think about what YouTube was, <laughs> was when it first came out. And it was, it was a strange place. And it wasn't going to keep any of your time. Right? You were going to watch a stupid video 30 times with your friends, and that was going to be it. But now they've, they've, they've engineered it in such a way that it captivates us. And we get these dopamine releases, and we get hooked to it to the point that we feel insecure or, or shamed or, or naked without it and without our time. Like, what am I going to miss? Well, probably nothing. Probably nothing that matters. This is really important. This is really key. And I think that this is the part that makes us the most angry is that God uses people to send us on our donkey missions. But it's God who's sending us, using people on our donkey missions. Because you would just love to hate your boss. You would love to hate your spouse, love to hate your friends, love to hate your, your neighbor, the people who send you on the donkey mission. It'd be real easy to hate them when you think that it's them that's causing you delay, when you think that it's them that's causing you to do things that you don't want to do or things that are a distraction or don't recognize or acknowledge your gifts and your greatness. But it's really God sending you on these donkey missions. A great way to know if you're on a donkey mission is if you feel too smart if you feel too qualified, in Saul's case, too tall or good looking. Right? Anybody struggle with that? Can I get an amen? You just you just too good looking. You just too good looking that people is <laughs> people sending you on donkey missions. Because you're too good looking. Just tell yourself that next time you got you're on a donkey mission, be like, they just telling me to do this because I look good. The donkeys made it home. They show up with the prophet, and the prophet's like, hey, I got some news for you. Uh, The donkeys are home. You don't have to worry about that anymore. There's something far more important happening right now because it was never about the donkeys in the first place. It was all about God God getting Saul away from his comfort so that God could introduce him into what God wanted to do in his life. All right, so I've got four thoughts. And we're going to close with Philippians 3. So when I get to Philippians 3, you can know I'm landing. So four thoughts about our past as it relates to donkey missions. Our past can't be cleanly broken out from our current reality. It wasn't designed to be that way. Our, our past is kind of like if you, anybody, anybody like gumbo? Can I get an amen? All right. Half of y'all know what's up. What else could there be? Jambalaya? Anybody? No? Gumbo? We'll go with gumbo. There's some things in gumbo, like a bay leaf. You don't want to eat a bay leaf. If the bay leaf makes it into your mouth, you've done something wrong. And you just, the texture, it doesn't match the gumbo. It doesn't, it's nothing to celebrate. It tastes like a tree leaf. But it was really important to the overall flavor of the gumbo. And once the bay leaf has been in the gumbo, you can't remove the impact that the bay leaf had on your gumbo. And you will most certainly know if the bay leaf was never in there. Because something will just be a little missing. Right? Okay. If you know, you know. If you don't, just trust me. (laughs) Side note, bay leaves were great in rice as well. If you're just just want the bay leaf right on top of there, take it. You're like, take that, toss that rice with All right. 
But our past has is filled with these moments that we'd rather not have in our mouth. They were really important for the overall seasoning of our life. It's awful when you take it by itself. But when you take it in the whole, you realize that that moment of pain and that moment of difficulty, that moment of bitterness or toughness that was indigestible, that was too much to handle in a moment, it turns out that was exactly the recipe to tenderize your heart to produce compassion and mercy and loving kindness and faithfulness in a way that it never would have been developed without the bay leaf in there. The next thought is this. You do not yet understand the impact of the good decisions you're making today. You made a decision today to come to church and worship with the people of God because maybe you're in a difficult season and you're trying to find direction. Maybe you're here because you just love Jesus and you came ready to worship because you want to honor him. Maybe you came here looking for relationships that could help get you on the right track or encourage you in the right direction. And you will not know the full impact of your decision to worship with the people of God for a long time. So don't quit if tomorrow is awful. We are so ready for immediate effect. Not understanding that the circumstances that we're in today are the result of things that were sown weeks and months and years and decades in the past. But then when we're sowing good seed, we expect the immediate result. Don't quit because you don't see God move on your behalf and break down every wall because you prayed three nights in a row or you decided to read your Bible. Don't quit on Jesus because you showed up to church three out of four weeks and your circumstance hasn't changed yet. You don't yet know the fruit of the seed that was sown by showing up with the people of God and worshiping and pouring out your heart before him and inviting him to transform your life. Don't quit because you haven't seen him come through yet. He's not done yet. You're not done yet. The bay leaf has some cooking to do. It's got some seasoning to do. And the more you show up, the more you'll find that God adds adds layers to it. He'll add some salt. We're just going to stick with this analogy. You need that salt. He'll have that pepper, that andouille sausage with the gumbo. So you start the roux with the butter. You start the, and and you got some flour in it. But what do you have to do? You don't just keep it comfortable. You got to burn it a little bit. You got to get it dark so the flavor comes out. <laughs> yeah, that, that just happened. But you got it. But, but it's the heat that prepares it for the flavor that it's going to carry and the benefit that it's going to bring. And the layers come in. And so you just, guys, I'm, I'm saying don't, the, the big idea here was don't quit because you're not experiencing the result that you thought you should expect from the good work that you've done because God's not done yet. And not every reward that we want is going to happen in this life. That's the hard part about Christianity. Some of us, like we're like, I'm going to keep going as long as God promises to pay off by my 30s, by my 40s, by my 50s, by retirement. By the time I'm on my deathbed, I'd better see the glory of God revealed in this way. But that's simply not what Christianity promises us. Some of the good that we do won't be fully realized until we're in glory with Jesus. Until this life has passed away and we stand with him in the new creation. And you you get to hear these words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And he hands you a crown, and you lay that crown down, and he hands you a crown, and you lay it down, because any accomplishment of our own is worth nothing in the presence of God. You haven't experienced the full benefit of your decision to follow Jesus. You haven't yet experienced the full blessing of devoting yourself to the people of God. You haven't yet experienced the benefit of giving yourself fully to the mission of God. The decisions that you're making have benefit for today, but they won't be fully realized for a lifetime or maybe even in this lifetime, but it's still worth it. It's still worth it. A little blood, sweat, and tears and obedience. And we get all of God. The next thought is this. Your past wants to claim sovereignty over your life, but it doesn't have that right. Jesus is the only one who has the right of sovereignty over your life. Now, I want to acknowledge here 
that some of you have experienced uh, various forms of abuse or neglect, which is also abuse. Because someone overstepped their role and abused power that they had over you in a moment. And so anytime we talk about our past, I want to I just, just want to acknowledge that I'm not saying, like, with everything that I say from here out, I'm not saying that it's not, that it's not real. I'm not saying that it was good. I'm not saying that it was right. I'm not saying that it was okay. I, what I am saying is that God wants to leverage it for your greatest good. And he will eventually and ultimately be glorified through it. Okay? And, and that's, a, that's a tough thing to hear. It's tougher to understand. It's toughest to say. So if you find yourself struggling as I begin to, as I go into this next part with, with the injustice of the things that you've encountered in your life and kind of the, the pain that you've experienced at the hands of, of mankind, I just want to acknowledge that we're not saying that that's not real and that that is not at the same layer or level of like a, a difficult conversation with your manager. Okay, so even though I'm not going to take time to divide between these things each time, I just, we, I just want you to, I, I want to acknowledge that, that some things are more difficult to find the goodness of God in than other things. And some things we'll be seeking for the rest of our life to try and gain understanding. But our gain isn't understanding. Our gain is encounter with God. Okay, so, so your past wants to claim sovereignty over your life in as benign or as difficult or uh, uh, abusive as your past might be. We cannot give it ultimate authority over our lives. When Saul came up to Samuel, Samuel said, this is what God wants to do in your life. And he said, but my past. Which is never more powerful than God's present promises. And God wants to invite us into his purposes, but we'll never get there if we give pain in our past ultimate sovereignty, lordship, rulership, uh, strength over our life. Are you tracking? Your past can tell you where you've gone but it can't tell you where you're, where you're going to go. Related to that, this is the last thought. God has a plan for your past, and so does the devil. The devil would love to lie to you and tell you that your past is what's sovereign. The devil would love to lie to you and tell you that that broken relationship, that that medical diagnosis, that that mental health struggle, that those things that you've done and you're ashamed of, that the things that have done for you, they've done to you and you're ashamed of, that those would define your life. That's the devil's whole goal is to, is to persuade you that, that those things are the authority in your life, but God has a plan for your life as well. After Saul walked through the land and came up empty-handed, God revealed that he was supposed to be an answer to prayer to the people of Israel. Paul just, or Saul just couldn't separate from his past. Enough to hear the word of God and give himself fully to God's purpose in his life. You'd see that as you look at the, at the life of Saul in, his, in those 22 chapters, he struggles the whole time to take God at his word. He tries to take matters into his own hands. He tries to protect himself. He tries to make his name great. He tries to push down anybody who would be a threat to him because he struggled for 22 chapters before a dreadful end to believe and trust God instead of believing and trusting his past. Here in 1 Samuel, we see a clue to move forward. The devil's plan for Samuel was to keep him locked up in smallness of where he came from. God's plan was for him to lead his people. And we see a mirror of this, kind of an echo of it, by a man with the same name, Saul, in the New Testament. Now this is, so this is 
we're talking about Saul, the king before David. That's what all this first Samuel stuff is. So the very first king of Israel. And now I'm talking about Saul, the Pharisee. Saul, who had an encounter with Jesus. And got, he, was, he, was, he, was, um, he was persecuting Christians and overseeing their, their, their capture and putting them in jail and overseeing their, their assassinations, their public murders for their fault because they were following Jesus. This Saul decided to go by his Greek name, Paul. So the guy who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. This guy, Saul, is sharing his testimony in Philippians chapter 3. And he said, man, I got a lot to boast about. I got quite a lineage. I've got quite a history in my family. I've got a lot I could be proud of and a lot of reasons that I could find a lot of confidence in this life. He said, I've also got some wounds. I've got some stuff I've done that I'm not proud of. I've caused more damage to the, to the way, to the Christian people than anybody else has caused. And I did it in the name of God. No, can you imagine the, the shame that he must feel when he realized that the people he was persecuting had it right all along? So when Paul considers all that was good about his life and all that was bad and wrong about his life, he says this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly price for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. What shakes Paul out of his past isn't his pressing. It's not his forgetting. It's the prize which is promised through Christ Jesus that calls him and draws him out of his past. Family, the Spirit of God wants to draw us out of our painful past. He wants to draw us out of our privileged past. He wants to invite us into his presence and into his purpose so that we can know and see the glory of God, not just in theory, but in reality, from day to day, from week to week, month to month, and for the rest of our lives. So we're with him fully in glory. For whatever good, for whatever's bad in his past, the only thing Paul, the other Saul, could do is look forward to what God had called him to, and agree with it every single day of his life. It starts with a single decision to believe God that he has a higher purpose for you than the one that you can create for yourself. It starts with a single decision to trust God that he can save you more than you can save you. It starts with a single decision to trust God and follow him for the rest of your life to trust him with your salvation to trust you with to trust him with your provision to trust him with your life with your relationships with every aspect of what it means to be human this is the invitation to know trust and follow Jesus if you make that decision today it's not just a decision for people who are new to Jesus it's a decision for people who've been walking with Jesus and it's just kind of been coasting just kind of riding it out. Yeah, I believe. I gave my life to Jesus five years ago. I even got, I got baptized, filled with the Spirit of God, prophesied. Good. That's good. But we don't ride on that. We ride on the everyday reality of the resurrection revealing itself in our life by renewing us and transforming us and giving us new life. Now, living a life that agrees with the invitation and the call of God requires some work. It requires submission and accountability to God and to, to other people. For some of us, it requires going to counseling and making sense out of those things in the past that just don't let go of our ankle. It is just for every step you take forward, you feel like in your molasses. You just can't move. You just, it's slow. Some of us need counseling help. Some of us need deliverance. Some of us need all of them at the same time and different ones in different seasons. Actually, all of us need all of them at some point to experience the goodness of God revealed in all of those ways. 
Good counseling isn't a sidestep from this encounter with God. Just so you know, good counseling clarifies the encounter with God and helps us understand how to agree with Him, how to walk with Him, how to stop kicking against His plan. I wonder who, I wonder who else has been on a donkey mission or maybe living in a donkey season and is ready for an encounter with God where he would clarify for you everything that he's inviting you into. And I don't mean what is the pinnacle of your career. That's not what I'm talking about. Greatness in scripture, greatness has little to do with your job title. Like when I think, when I tell you, like greatness in the church, Jesus defined it as being a servant. So don't be surprised if in an encounter with God, he tells you, oh, these, this is how you're going to serve people. Not this is how people are going to serve you. Don't be surprised if God tells you this is how your money is going to work to advance the kingdom of God. Not this is how the riches from heaven are going to make you wealthy and get you all new things.